What is up, Thrive Fam? CJ Finley here again with another episode of the Thrive on Life podcast. It's Sunday, and I got my buddy Sam in the building. We're going to have a conversation, but before we kick it off, listen to this. What are we sipping on here? CJ, my man, you are sipping on the Oslo Lime and Mint Spritz. Um, it is the world's first smart seltzer. Uh, we're not a hard seltzer. We are not a LaCroix uh, basically just a super refreshing and delicious carbonated herbal tea with all the goodness. Why? Why? That is such a good question. Um, as he takes another sip, <laughs> you got to remind yourself <laughs> of, of what we're doing here. Um, basically I, I mean, it's a long story and we're going to get into this throughout the, uh, entirety of the podcast, but this product in particular was basically what brought me Brought me out of the world of selling software and into the world of really focusing on health, wellness, myself, and, and kind of going through that whole journey. Um, and this drink is just the most delicious thing that I've <laughs> that I found, and I loved it so much that I decided to go all, all in on the product here. Oh yeah, well I appreciate you showing up here today. It's Sunday, and I love spending my days doing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But it's always something that I'm grateful for when other people want to spend it. In the same way because there's a million other things that you can be doing in this world on a Sunday afternoon well morning going into afternoon and one of the first things that I want to get into is kind of dissecting how you even got to be working on this product because as we're going into a new year there's a lot of people out there that are questioning what they're doing with their lives should I stay in my corporate career path should I start a side hustle should I go all in on the thing that I have started because I believe it could be something bigger than it is right now and I'd love to run through your journey with that. So you mentioned software sales. How did you even get into software sales in the first place? Because I feel like there's a lot of other people out there that end up in arenas that they shouldn't be in in the first place. Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you for welcoming me into your home. This is uh, the my favorite way to spend a Sunday morning is just doing cool shit with cool people. So uh, very happy to be here. But yeah, these the path to... Software sales and everything kind of started, uh, you know, grew up in the Midwestern suburbs, uh, suburb of Chicago, very kind of traditional family. Parents uh, still live in the, the hometown that I grew up in and the house that I grew up in and very much had a very traditional childhood, I guess you would say. Uh, one that, you know, I had two older sisters who kind of paved a path, both going to, you know, University of Illinois State School. Uh, getting a really good job out of school. And and I kind of was set down the path of of mirroring and mimicking a lot of what I saw. Um, and that led to me going to University of Illinois, studying finance, um, graduating, getting a job with Ernst & Young, um, you know, a job where my family was very, very happy to tout <laughs> that I was working for a big four uh, accounting firm and, you know, something that people recognized and, and were excited about and thought was you know, quote unquote, prestigious. And I got there immediately knew that it just wasn't for me. I was, you know, working for, uh, working on projects with large banks. Um, and anyone that's in consulting or has been in consulting knows that you always get the leftover space that they have. So no matter what, for 10 months, it was windowless rooms. I would be stuck in like a converted, you know, storage closet or kind of like an electrical room of sorts. And 12 hours a day, no, no, no natural sunlight. I was eating like shit, eat, drinking, you know, on somebody else's dime um, and knew I needed to make a change. So that was the first kind of like pivotal decision I made was going to visit a friend in San Francisco for a weekend and being there and like feeling the energy of the city and just like knowing that that was not at all what I was getting in the windowless rooms of Tampa, Florida at the time. Um, and yeah, it just was like, I think I can sell something. So I decided to talk to a, a buddy who had a cousin who worked at a company. And three months later, I moved to San Francisco and, and decided to go in there. So that, that was the, the start of the software journey that then led to the overall Oslo journey. What's crazy to me is your windowless journey was in Tampa, Florida. Isn't there like, it's got to be similar to Austin where there's 300 sunny days a year. <laughs> it there, was they're putting you in windowless or areas yeah. to work. Like, it was it was remarkable. So it was, I mean, and you know, this is almost like ten years ago now. So I, I don't feel like I'm outing anybody here. But so we were on like the Citibank. City Citibank has like a massive campus in Tampa, Florida, or right outside it. And 
gorgeous. I mean, I was there from like September through February, March. So like be the perfect time to be in Florida outside of like the hurricane season. Um, but yeah, I would be in a windowless room, literally just like rows of tables and computers. And we would emerge for lunch and it would just be gorgeous. And you're just like standing around like you almost, you know, feeling like you're melting because <laughs> you hadn't seen the sun in six hours. Um, and yeah, go to lunch savor those moments eating chipotle burritos with with my with the homies uh shout out uh, jeremy and and julia um and then go back and, and be there for another six hours so it's interesting how different but similar a lot of the stories i hear on the show are i started my career at ubs wealth management so much like city it was i still remember the first floor of the office in weehawken and some of the people that for their first year that got put there. And I remember thinking like, if I had gotten put in that basement, like I was out like day week one, I, I just, I couldn't fathom that this was an environment people work in. And that was like one of the first things for me that really made me step back and ask myself, what does it mean to even work? Because over the next 30, 40, 50 years, I knew I'd have to enter the workforce and produce something of value to not just pay my bills, but to live the life that I wanted to live. And when you, you're almost taken aback when you see some of the environments that people accept to work in. And for me, that was like one of the major things where um, I actually signed a contract to, to move to Nashville. And fortunately, my desk backed, uh, we were like on like 14th floor. So my desk backed the window. So I was fortunate enough to be right on the window uh, that created other problems because a lot of times I would just stare at the window rather than doing my work, but whole different story, but run us through. So you went from that environment to the software sales environment to now where you're at today. Like, tell us a little bit of the story of jumping into San Francisco and, and what that looked like. And then the positives and negatives of that. Absolutely. And just to, to your point too, it's uh, the, the project that I was on at Ernst & Young was kind of known. It was notorious throughout the entire firm as being like the worst project you could be on. So I'd go to these like networking events and people would just be like, oh, we're, we're, you know, where are you working right now? And I would say Banamex and, and they would be like, oh, it gets better. <laughs> and that was, so I, I found myself on like the worst, you know, quote unquote, the worst project you could be on. And everyone would tell me it would get better. And I would just be like, but I don't know if I want it to. Like, if, if this is if this is what's being shown to me, like, I, I think I need to do something different. And, and it was this, you know, I went for that 10 months. It was a very tumultuous, a lot of inner turmoil, both from, it was the first time I, like, you know, felt myself being, like, depressed. Like, I didn't see the sun forever, and like, at all during the day. And was working on things that I was not passionate about. Stuff that just really seemed like it didn't matter. Like, it, it literally was, like, felt like worthless work that I was doing. Um, so was feeling really down on myself and people are just like, you know, you got them champ. You can keep going you know, it gets better. And when I would bring it up to people in my family and whatnot, the, also the very supportive individuals, but they, on paper, it looked like I was crushing it. It was working for Ernst and Young was on projects. I was wearing a suit to work. I was, you know, going out to these nice steakhouse dinners and somebody else was paying for it. And inside, I just knew that like, this just isn't it. Like, there's no way that this is what's going on. Um, so that's why that, that first time I went to San Francisco and I like, like no joke, like breathed in fresh air in Dolores park and just saw the energy and the, the happiness. It was like, I almost was like, I was so longing for that feeling to come back to me that it was like, if this is where this is, I need to be here. Um, so that was what kind of like prompted the, the, the move from Ernst Young. And I, I mean, I was living in Chicago, like broke the news to my family at my birthday, my 23rd birthday brunch and was met with some interesting looks and stares. But yeah, three weeks later, I was on a plane moving out to San Francisco and, um, that was the best decision I could have made for myself because it allowed me to start fresh. And, and I think this is something that I, I noticed with a lot of my friends who similarly, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and I moved to Chicago. So I'm surrounded by all these known people, places, things. And I was kind of like stuck in this kind of repetitive life. That was one that I knew wasn't that I wanted to live, um, but couldn't quite get away from. And so San Francisco was like a hard reset. 
Uh, so working, you know, at a new company where I knew nobody and starting out my, my routine with like going, getting into the gym and eating well and cooking for myself and, and all these different things. So it was a really powerful, hard reset. Um, but very quickly I learned that, you know, the, the problems that I was running away from at Ernst and Young were some of it was inherent there, but a lot of it was just like my disdain for working in a corporate environment, you know, like it was, it was very amplified in a place like EY. And then at a place uh, that I worked at, it was called Okta. Um, and I was, you know, joined, I was like 500 employees, so pretty small company. But as I was there over two years, grew to be over a thousand and, um, you know, a lot of the same things of like layers of management and bureaucracy and everything was showing back up. And I noticed that like my natural inclination was to be like, fuck that. Like, I don't, I don't want to listen to these rules. So I would find ways to, to create different things within it. Um, and it wasn't until I got passed over on like three different promotions at, at Okta where I realized that I needed to make another change. Um, and that was another moment of like, you know, had, had this really clear path. I mean, the company was, had just IPO'd is the kind of like the, the dream scenario of moving to San Francisco, working at a tech company and you, you work at a company that is doing well enough to IPO. Like that's, you know, one in a thousand, one in a 10,000 type type deal. And I was like, okay, I'll be here forever. This is going to be great. And I go for three different interviews, three different promotions. One, one job gets dissolved. They don't hire anyone for it. Another job, they, like, I kind of botched the interview. It was like a, a different role and, you know, hand up, kind of fucked that one up. That was not, not a great one. And then the third one didn't hire, or didn't promote me because I interviewed for the other two. And they're like, yeah, it seems like you're not committed to this. I'm like, what? <laughs> How is that the thing that's happening here? So um, I eventually go and work for um, another, like, super small company. It was, I was a 19th employee. And that was where my eyes were open to the world of entrepreneurship. And it's the... You know, even though I was working at a startup, I didn't see any of the business being done. Um, and even though I was working at a consulting company that was reporting to, you know, a bank and how that was operating, again, I was just kind of doing the the checkbox stuff. Um, but moving into working for a company called Solvi, um, I saw like decisions being made and business being conducted. And that's where I was like, this is this is cool. Like I, I want to see, I want, I want to do this. I want to, I want to sit in that seat where the CEO is right now. Like that's what's going and had no idea what I was going to end up going in on. And, and as you know, not to spoil it, a drink company is a very far, <laughs> far distance away from uh, financial consulting and software, but, but know. we'll, but we'll get there because yeah. there's a lot of people in old Sam's shoes. Yeah. And that's really why I wanted to give you the space to talk about that because I mean, for me, it just brings up two things. <laughs> One, trauma. Mm -hmm. Like the same, I went through the same trauma of like a similar things that you're going through. But then two, appreciation for following my heart and my gut and what I wanted from life. Because one of the questions I want to ask you revolves around decision making. And I'm a big believer in really it's the 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 seed to anything in life of production and producing value and making your life better is decision our decisions right this you decide to improve your habits you decide to have that hard conversation you decide to take the job switch the job move to a different city you decide what you're drinking on an everyday basis so like right now mm -hmm. what we're drinking right you have so many decisions throughout a day and if you don't have a framework for those decisions and who you want to be then there's going to be major problems in your life. And for so long in my life, I was allowing my decisions to be dictated by the external forces, either my parents, uh, friends, family, school. And then as soon as I got to be, I'd say like 16, 17, 18, I was like, I'm going to be on my own soon. I started switching this throttle. And what on the outside, what it looks like is like black sheep, or you're trying to piss people off or mm -hmm. you're trying to be rebellious. But the reality is I was trying to find who I was. What did I want from life? And most people don't do that until like, I'm still working with my parents on that and they're in their 60s. So like a lot of people, and granted, if you go back, even just, I talk about this all the time, like 15 years when there was no internet on your phone, choices were a lot more limited. So I want to be 
gracious in saying in today's world we can move to San Fran whenever we want. There's Airbnb. Like you have so much mobility today in a lot of different ways. I want to make that very clear to whoever's listening on the other end of this. But so many people still don't take advantage of that. And I want to learn a little bit more about how 23-year-old Sam had the cojones to make those decisions because that's what I think the difference maker is. And I want to inspire more people, male or female, to make that decision now. Like don't wait 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now and be wondering what if. Like make it now. Why could Sam make that at 23 versus other people not being able to do it? It's such a great question. And and I, you know, after I answer, I want to hear about you being able to do it at 16 because as a 16 year old and even like the, the college I went to, I mean, it was a great school. Don't regret it at all, but it was the school that my sisters went to. So that's how it, you know, and, and so much of the decisions that I was making up until that pivotal point at 23 were what was either prescribed to me or presented to me, or, you know, I thought was the quote unquote right path and not really falling and it all you know comes back to the gut instinct but what got me to be able to do that at 23 and literally like you know make that decision was I was like at my at darkest points you know very very it literally was was dreading life and dreading waking up and you know had this whole I would say like a six month period of time where I just wasn't sleeping you know and it and I thought that it so for the bulk of that time i thought it was because there's something fundamentally wrong with me and like this everything is presented in front of me i'm working at the company that every one of my friends wanted to work at i'm doing things like going out to dinner on somebody else's dime that like people are you know like so envious of and i would hear that from all these different things and then i would sit at home when things got quiet and like be trying to sleep and i would just like like this it can't be my life. Like this, this can't be it. And it eventually, like, I didn't know that there was an out until I hit like total rock bottom. Absolutely was like depressed to the point where I didn't want to live anymore. And, you know, I mentioned that going to San Francisco where like I, f- I saw light and I saw happiness and I saw this for the first time. And it was like, in this area, there is darkness and over here there is light. And I finally was like, what if I just went there? Like, what if I just decided to go live there? And that presented the issue of like, you know, I was, I didn't feel comfortable telling anyone that I was at that point. Like I was, I was very much hiding it in, in all ways, but trying to articulate to people that care about me as a person to be like, listen, if I stay here, it's not good. Like they're, we're, we're headed on a path that's not good. Over here, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I know it's not that. And I need to be away from this and go toward that. Um, and I really think, you know, it was the the back against the wall. Like I got no, I don't really have any other choices. I don't know what other option I have. I just so happened to go to, it probably could have been a, any host of cities that that if I went there and a similar sensation happened, but it happened to be San Francisco. It happened to be quote unquote, like opportunities, Silicon Valley, you know, and I, I think the, opportunities there lended itself well to my skill set. Um, but really it was like, you know, I don't think I have, I don't have any other options, so I need to go choose this one. Um, but I, I would love to hear about your cultivation of this and, and maybe if you had any moments of 16, 17, 18, because it took me living somebody else's dream for those seven years of time through college and, and going into school that to get to the point where it's like, if this is, if this is, if I'm living your dream and I'm really upset, like maybe this isn't worth it. So I don't know what was happening for you. Yeah. I, I would, first off, thank you for sharing that. It, it relates a lot. I want to be clear. Like I didn't have it figured out at 16, 17 or 18. Like you kind of had figured out the light versus the darkness. I didn't figure that out until roughly 23, 24, 25 as well. But I started making decisions at like 16, 17, 18 that were like a little bit against the grain mm. of everybody else. Like, I mean, it, it would it would be, and this is like super me. Like I took the SAT twice. The time that I scored the best, I was at a party the night before until 2 a.m. Fucked up. Yeah. And then I show up, take the SAT. I do better than when I had actually tried to study for it. That, but that might sound like a stupid story, but that was the first time in my life where I was like, I started thinking, what is the point of any of this? I'm going to do this on my terms. Like, why do I have to show up to these 
SAT prep things and, and be so stressed out like all these other people are. I'm like, this is fucking stupid. Like that's, I started having that mindset of a lot of the shit around me is really stupid. I'm not going to play into this. And it looked rebellious to other people out there, but it was r really me just planting my flag of like what I actually cared about and what game I wanted to play. So when I got into college, what it really looked like was, so I played collegiate soccer. I was in engineering and I was in a fraternity. And I think what I did differently than other people in, in that frame was I was kind of balancing, like I'd literally go into classes, I get my class uh, schedule and I'd be like, what am I gonna get an A in and what am I gonna get a C in and mm -hmm. just not care about? I don't think a lot of other people think that way. Like they're just like following whatever it is. And here's another example of like, I'm just like thinking out loud here. My senior year, I took two classes at the same time. I took a class, let's say it was like 4 p.m. on a Monday. I took, I technically signed up for 4 p.m. on a Monday at Rutgers where I went, and then I signed up 4 p.m. on a Monday at a community college because I was allowed to take like a certain amount of credits at a community college as well. Um, for, I forget what the reasoning is. If you like fit, if you withdraw from a class or fail a class, which I did, you're allowed to like go to a community college and take like up to two classes. Mm. So I took the classes at the same time and I had somebody click into me for the one class and then I would show up to the other class that was harder that I needed to be at. And the reason I did that was before going into that semester, I knew that that one teacher, it's a big class, all you have to do is click in and show up for the exams. And that's exactly what I did. And I was making these decisions on my terms. And even before that, like when I was thinking of job and like making money as like a teenager, a lot of my friends were like working at Acme or the gas station. Wawa is a big thing on the East Coast. Love I Wawa. Would, yeah, me too. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, maybe less nowadays because back then I ate like shit. So it's like, I don't even know what I would go in there and buy it these days. If you're a coffee drinker, people love it for that or like hoagies and things. But um, one of the things that I realized was like, I don't want to sit here and make my, I don't want to make $7 an hour, $8 an hour. So I started thinking like, how do I make more cash in less time? And that was my, though that combination was my inkling. Now the problem was I continued to just follow the normal path for four to five years. I got the engineering degree. I started my first job at UBS wealth management. I didn't necessarily have, I think the reason that I didn't just jump into entrepreneurship was Instagram. Like I couldn't see outside of my bubble that Instagram wasn't a thing. YouTube was just starting to become bigger and I couldn't see anything. So I just followed the masses of like my girlfriend at the time worked at GE Capital and banking was like, whether you were a banker or you're on the tech side, like that's where the money was at. So I was like, I'm just going to follow the money mm -hmm. and I'm going to buy the suit. And I got there right away and started to ask myself, I couldn't sit in class. Like I was the guy that on a Friday, if it was a nice day out, I would go, I would skip class with my friends and we would go surf or we would go do like, that's just how I've always been. And when I got to work, I was like, I don't know why I thought I could like show up to a desk and not be the guy that I was in college. So there was a lot of conflict really quickly. And last part of the story, I knew that I had to get out because UBS, I was in this graduate training program, which is a prestigious, prestigious pro program. Like it does do a lot for a lot of people. And they sent us to Switzerland we worked there for five weeks. I had everything paid for. It was beautiful. It was like one of the best trips of my life. But we were in a boardroom for like 10 hours of the day. And I remember you had the vividness of darkness and light. We were in this boardroom. All these other, I would call them kids because we're 22, 23, 24, are just like working and they're excited to work together. And I'm sitting there looking out the window like, what the fuck are we doing in here? Like I can see the Alps. And we're in this little boardroom, like talking about shit that doesn't matter yep. at the end of the day to present this project at the end of five, five weeks to, to make ourselves feel good and, and look good in the eyes of executives. And I knew at that moment, I was like, I can't stay. Like I'm, I'm already planning my out and people just couldn't believe it. So I was the first person to actually leave. Like I didn't even last. I had to, I had to wait because we had a bonus that I didn't want to have to pay back. And I got to 11 months and put in my resignation. Um, and I was the first person to leave that program because it's like a two-year program, I believe. Yeah. It was the first of our, our year. 
to leave. So long-winded story, but it was like I was showing signs earlier on, but I didn't really make that decision until I would say I was truly on my own and I could, honestly, it was it was Erin. Instagram started and she started creating her own content and it kind of got me thinking of like this whole new world's opening up. Um, but I'd love to... I'd love to fast forward this a little bit. Um, thank you for asking me that that side of the question. Um, well, and, and quickly before we move on, you hit on a couple points that I think are so important. And the first being, you can learn, you can you can see the answer, but it'll take you a lot of time before you're able to actually implement it. Like you knew that you didn't want to do anything corporate for a very long time, but it took like being in the spot and feeling it to be like, okay, yeah, we need to go do something. To else. that point. I could feel it. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Like okay. when I was younger, the, the, I'm going to get fucked up the night before the SAT. Like you can't correlate that when you're younger to, oh, I'm not going to be able to sit at a desk. Yeah. But now I look back, I'm just like, oh, like I didn't like the rules of that system. It wasn't, there's no innate problem with the way that I did things or the way that other people do things. I just didn't like that system. Yeah. I couldn't correlate it to what it actually meant. Yeah. And then and the, the last part you said about Aaron, kind of like it was seeing her content is I, until you are exposed to that option or that opportunity, it is so impossible to like envision it or, or more like never, nevertheless, like going all in on it. And it, it really took me sitting in that room where it's a 19 person company. I'm across the table, like from where we are right now, like that's where the CEO sat. This is where I sat. And I was able to see somebody running a company and making decisions and and basically demystify it to the point where it's like, I think I could do that. Like this guy's a he's a genius and he's really, really hardworking and he's all these different things, but like I think I could do that. And it was it was that moment that had me kind of shift my thinking to like, okay, what does that look like as opposed to following the path that we're on? So it's very very mirrored very well there. Yeah, and I think there's so many people out there like that. I think the other thing for me was, I mean, there's seven plus billion people on earth. Like there's so many ways to go about a life. Like as soon as you kind of get into these, like you had three jobs, you start seeing like, okay, what's similar, what's different. And then you start understanding like to the point of view or right across from the CEO, like environment is everything. Really, that's just the thing that you need to solve for. So if you're listening Mm -hmm. to this, it's just put yourself in an environment where there's like-minded people around you or people that you want to become. Because when I was in the corporate world, that was that that would come up. It would be like, well, who do you look up to? And I look around and I'm like, not a single person here. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't say anything bad about them though. That's what yeah. people think. It's like, oh, I'm pointing fingers. It's like, I don't want to be these people. That means they must suck. No, it's like, I'm gonna point the finger at myself. Mm-hmm. I'm in the wrong room. Totally. It doesn't mean that they're they're the problem. I am the problem. As soon as I started solving for that life change. And it's, I mean, I was actually just talking to uh, my, my Lyft driver on the way over here too. It's just like uh, the, all I've learned in my life is what I don't want to do. Like there's very few times where I'm like, you know, in the moment of genius of like, this is exactly what I want to do, but everything is just like, okay, so I'm working, you know, my, my first internship was um, cold calling for a private equity or a private wealth management company. And like, Nope. Don't want to do that. Like cold calling for eight hours a day, no chance. And I did end up cold calling again, but you know, we, we all make for mistakes. different reasons. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but like, you know, then I'm consulting for a bank and like, I don't care. I studied finance, but oh yeah, Sam, every time you were just like, I don't understand slash care about any of this stuff I'm learning. I just, I'm good at math. So, you know, like that was the, so check that Then I'm in like the software sales. It's like, well, I don't really care about software either. So like, hmm. but you just kind of, you continue to collect these this knowledge of what speaks to you and what doesn't and what speaks louder to me is stuff that I don't like. Um, and so being able to eliminate that and every step, try to get fewer of those things involved in what I'm, in what I'm working on is kind of the path that's, you know, led me to starting my own company where I'm doing everything and a lot of things that I don't necessarily like to do. But one of the biggest things is I'm not answering to somebody. So it's a, yeah, that's, that's the tricky part is once you get into something like running what you're running now, you almost amplify the stuff that you don't like to do because when you have a job, the thing you're doing every day is the thing that isn't necessarily inspiring you, but you only have a couple things that you're doing that you don't like versus once you get into that CEO role, like for a couple of years, it's like you're doing a lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily say is in your wheelhouse. The thing that has always kept me going though in that is 
one, you're not, you're not answering to anybody else. So, but then two, it's for a bigger purpose that you get to set. So when you're doing something that you don't necessarily like to do, or you're fired up to do, it's easy to kind of be disciplined in doing it. If you're the one that's setting the vision of like, I know where this is going to get me. But the problem with the corporate world is like, you don't, there's no, like, if I show up every day, do something I don't like, and then I don't get those three raises, like you're talking about, well, I'm fucked. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you don't get to set the hierarchy in that versus if I do something that let's say this podcast, right? As soon as this is over, I have to clip up. I have to merge the audio and the video and like do things that I wouldn't be like, Oh my God, I want to do this every day. Right. But the outcome is a beautiful episode with Sam. So I can easily just like literally last night I was working on an episode on a Saturday night until 9 PM. Right. So I'm able to do that because I'm like, Oh, the end goal is something that I'm setting. Um, but let's, let's shift gears. How the hell did you get into CBG and even more so selling drinks? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, yeah, cause we, we could riff on what we were just talking about forever. Um, I mean the, it's a very, so I, I will pick up where I'm sitting across from the CEO and like, that was the moment where I knew I wanted to build something and I had no idea what I wanted to do or like what it was going to be. And all I knew is that I didn't want it to be a software company. Like that was all I knew is that working in software, the, that environment and, and that kind of like process was not at all where I saw myself. Um, coincidentally around that time I started like we in software sales, you go to a lot of happy hours. Um, and so we would have people flying in from different parts of the country that we were working with and we'd all go to happy hour and kind of like one of my, you know, icebreaker questions is like, what's your drink at the bar? The kind of thing, things that evolved. I think at the time I was a big, like whiskey, ginger ale guy. Um, whiskey, ginger, but seven I, and seven, seven and seven. Yeah. Was one of the things. I used to drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I can't, I can't. Seven. Um, but this guy named Sam Collin, uh, also named Sam, he was in town from New York. I asked him the question and his answer was a tequila soda. And I remember in that moment I had like a visceral, like, like disgusted reaction because like tequila was the, I bartended in college. Like tequila was what I would give people if I like didn't like them, you know, like they would come there and they're like, can we get, can we get some shots? And it'd be like, here's your seven, seven dollar bottle of tequila type deal. Uh, but he started breaking down the fact like why he drank tequila was because, you know, unlike vodka, whiskey, everything that's made with starches, like uh, agave is actually something that's like, it's natural. It's a plant. It is less of a depressant than all the other alcohols. Um, supposedly it's uh, easier for your body to digest and leads to less of a hangover. And all of that is like scientifically questionable, but really what it was for me in that moment was like the first time I saw somebody or was in like, um, exposed to somebody making a decision on what they consumed based off of how it made them feel like up until that point, like it was a very mindless consumption journey for me. And that person telling me, Sam, Sam telling me that he drank. Does he know this? Yeah. We sat okay. down and talked about it a okay. couple of times. Yeah, he's uh he's the man. Um, but so that was like very interesting. But still I had like I was disgusted about this idea of a tequila soda. The next weekend I go to New York. Um, I am there for work. I'm staying with a buddy I know from high school, and I kind of just casually ask him, I was like, have you ever heard of anyone drinking a tequila soda before? And he was just like, Yeah, I love it all the time. That's like that's all me and my friends drink here. I'm like, okay, well, this is this is interesting. So I decided to do what a little, year was this? This is twenty eighteen. Yeah, 2018. Okay. Um, I feel like that, yeah, it, because I I mean, I drank, I was a big tequila drinker. I yeah. still remember in college, we went to PCB, uh, um, Panama City Beach for spring break. Mm -hmm. And I would literally just be walking around with like a, a th th that at that time, it was like the nice bottle of tequila. I think I spent like 50 bucks on it or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> but th that's what I'd be going around with and put it sparkling water and some, uh, some lime in it. We'll see you go. No one's surprised. You're, you're ahead of the curve here. Yeah. Um, you were, you were making decisions at 16 that I was making at 23, but, um, yeah, man. Uh, so I, so I decide the next day that I'm like, you know what, we're going to, let's see what this tequila soda business is about. And I did a, we call it market research where I drink nothing but tequila soda for a day. Um, but basically the, at the end of that day, first of all, I noticed that like I felt different. And it could have been the tequila, but it could also have been just like the first time where, again, I was like making an intentional choice of like, I'm drinking this because of this. Yeah. And I was walking on the streets of Manhattan with my buddy and I was like, 
there's something here. Like it, whether it's tequila, whether it's this like, you know, mindful drinking movement. Um, I don't know exactly what struck me that moment, but I'm like, I literally turned to my friend. I'm like, this is it. Like, we're going to make a company around this. Um, and so that's why the first, the first iteration of it was a, a mixer for tequila. Like I basically was like, okay, looking at the landscape, I know you know, the rocks coming out with the tequila. George Clooney has a tequila. Like, you know, I feel pretty good about myself, but at the same time, I know I don't carry the same weight that those individuals have. So it's like, I can't really compete from a tequila brand standpoint. Um, but how do I align with it and build something alongside it that, uh, that can kind of like, you know, ride the coattails of the tequila train and also, you know, accomplish this goal of like creating a product, building a business and everything I wanted to do. So the first thing that, that we created was this like, uh, was this mixer, like a better for you mixer for tequila. Um, and that kind of came about because, you know, we were drinking tequila sodas, but I'm like, everyone that I introduce this to is, doesn't like the taste. Like everyone that drinks tequila soda very rarely is like, wow, this is the most delicious drink I've ever had. It's more like you're enduring it because of the outcome or because this is like, yeah, and once you, you get two in, it doesn't, the taste doesn't, it matter doesn't matter. Either. Exactly. <laughs> but I was like, okay, what if there was something that tasted good, but didn't have, it wasn't like super sugary, like margarita mixes are. So is this kind of like a low sugar or low calorie kind of option that we were, that I was messing around with. Um, and that, so the, yeah, that was like May, 2018. When I first come up with the idea, I, you know, attempt to build it for about two and a half years. Like I even go so far as to moving out of San Francisco back to Chicago to live with my folks to like save money. And I'm I think that decision is going to like really make me focus in on this. And in reality, like all I did was, you know, tread a theme of my life is when I go to Chicago, I don't, I'm not the best version of me. And it was very interesting to see that mirrored where I, I was making a decision to try to build this company. And I just kind of fell back into old habits and, and really, you know, the, the old ruts that I was in. Um, but that's the easier path. Is so. It always is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or was the easier path, but it, it wasn't until, it wasn't until the pandemic hit. So I, 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 you know, go back to Chicago and there's a crazy story as to how I like even, you know, figure out how to make this thing. Cause as if anyone's listening, I sold software and studied finance. I don't know food chemistry or anything. So I ended up partnering with, with this uh, woman who's, she's got James Beard awards for mixology. She's incredible. Shout out to Eden. We're, we're going to do a lot of shout outs today. Um, but so I have the product, I'm like deciding to launch it. Um, April 22nd, 2020, that would be my 28th birthday. And all of a sudden, you know, as everyone knows, March hits, pandemic comes, the world shuts down, launching a drink business is not not really the best thing. So I kind of like enter this period of time from March until we'll call it October of 2020, where I was so certain that I couldn't continue to sell software, but you know, it felt like the world was telling me that this drink business wasn't a good idea. I went in, like, was like, okay, I'll do anything. I go get my real estate license. I'm like trying to just find any outs. Um, but it wasn't until I had a great conversation with uh, a mentor of mine, Josh, who I was telling him about this like master plan I had for like to become a real estate mogul, which was hilarious in retrospect. Cause I, had, I, had, <laughs> I had no, Dude, you're, idea. you're definitely an entrepreneur. Yeah. I had, I had no idea <laughs> what I was doing, but I, I basically like went on this like big, you know, we, we were catching up and I spent like 20 minutes telling him about this whole master plan I had of like, you just kind of doing it. It's like, sounds like you want to be a real estate developer. Number one. Okay. Number two, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> like, where's this coming from? Uh, we've been talking for two years about your, about this drink company. And then all of a sudden, like you, one thing, this hiccup happens and, and all of a sudden you want to go this completely different direction. I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, like, I mean, it's like the, 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 the signs are here. God's telling me I can't do this thing. And he's like, okay, whatever. I mean, all, all I heard is that you couldn't launch it in April. Like you probably could still do it. But uh, if this is what you want to do, fully support you. But like, just think about it before you completely throw away this thing that you've been building for two years. I'm like, fuck, you know, like, man, why, <laughs> why'd you got to blow up my spot like that? Um, but then, you know, I really thought about it and I was like, okay, well, I, I coincidentally was reading David Goggins can't hurt me at the time. And it's like, okay, well, I'm so consumed with, figuring out what the fur like the perfect decision is, I could probably just do all of it and it's going to naturally show itself to me. Like I might as well like do the real estate thing, try to build this business, try to sell software. And like, I will be pulled towards what is interesting or what is, what is the path that I should go down? Um, so I spent two, you know, I had a conversation with my CEO. He dangled like 
ungodly amounts of money in front of me to like hit my number because COVID times, no one was buying software. I spent, I was like, okay, I'm going to lock in. Let's crush this. I lasted two days, like two days into caring about software again. I was just like, yep, that this ain't it. <laughs> like we can cross this one out right now. Um, and I was going on the real estate path and it was, you know, I ended up getting my license and what was interesting or cool about the real estate path is that when you pass, um, you pass the exam, your score is good for 12 months and you, you need to go like join a brokerage in 12 months in order for it to like turn into an actual license, but you're, you don't need to do anything for the 12 months. And I was like, okay, well, I have this license available for me. 12 months seems like a good, like runway for me to go all in on the drink. And if, if this drink business doesn't turn in, into anything, 12 months later, I can come back to Chicago, I'll, you know, get into the real estate game, we'll, we'll do it. But at least I'll, I'll know when I'll have scratched this itch. Um, so that was what gave me the, the 12 month runway. So that was like October, 2020. And then I'm like, okay, well, if, if the last two years is any evidence of my ability to operate as a high level human in Chicago, like we should we'd probably not start this business here. Like if I want to take this seriously, I need to get into a different environment. You know, we talked about that earlier. What's what the proximity and the, the environment being so important. Um, and I just started like, you know, finger on a map looking at different places. But the one place that had always spoken to me uh, for a long time was Denver. And I grew up snowboarding, skiing, everything. I would go there all the time. But for something about Colorado and Denver just felt like a like a good place, like a good breeding ground for this. Um, so I booked a flight, went to Colorado and spent a week there just as like a, you know, for the first time, could I live here? Could I start a business here? Stayed with friends, you know, went around talking to a bunch of people about the, the, the business and the idea I had. And yeah, got back from that. I'm like, I think my world's about to change. Like we're, we're about to go do this thing. So that was, then I eventually moved there in May or February, 2021 to like actually go all in on the business. So I'm, I'm bouncing around. I don't know if I answered any of the questions you asked, but <laughs> no, it's, this is great. And it just kind of, just the way that you respond will showcase to somebody else out there that it's the answer just doesn't come from God. Mm. It doesn't just like come and land in your lap in the moment going back. We can always say, Oh, like I listened to this one thing and then made this decision. But when you're in the moment, I think the, greatest piece of wisdom you gave was I'm going to, I'm just going to do it all. And then whatever pulls me, I think the issue with a lot of people out there is they get over on that. They don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing it all and then seeing what pulls them, they sit there on the couch and they're like, I could be doing all of these different things. And they're just overwhelmed. I love your advice because the only way through is through something I say to myself all the time because we all bitch and complain and moan to ourselves all the time. But if you create, again, going back to a framework of how to make decisions, that is one of the frameworks is just like finding solid quotes to repeat to yourself. I've mentioned David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me. I read that book during COVID as well. And that's one of the reasons I started running mm. um, yeah, at that moment. There was a lot of other reasons I started running. You can find other content on that. But one of them was hearing how he got into running and like what, what came out of it for him. And that's why I was just like, Oh, well it's 2020. Not much is going on. I'm just going to try all these different things for, for 30 days. Actually, my wife and I were like, let's just do a 30 day list of random shit to do and see what sticks. One of them for me was, was running. Yeah. Um, we did like yoga and like, um, there's a bunch of stuff we did. I did. That's when I started doing like red light stuff and, um, sauna ice and just like everything just started coming together once I kind of threw spaghetti more spaghetti at the wall and then saw what stuck and I think it's such a simple piece of advice that not enough people take but I'd love to kind of go into piecing together that moment that you kind of decided to go on to where it's at today so if you mm -hmm. can give a synopsis of because that isn't that much time like I mean 2020 was only three years ago yep so going from okay, I'm going to do this tequila mixer and then I'm going to move to this new city to, for anyone listening out there, like I have this can in my hand. We did an event yesterday where he's handing out bunches of cans and then you still have this mixer in a glass jar that's sitting in my refrigerator right now. I know the ins and outs of business and how it takes so much to get to that point. Give us some of the highlights of from Denver 
you decided to go there too. This can is sitting in my hand here today. Yeah. Um, so it's, so we launch in May 2021, and it's this tequila mixer, and it's immediately met with a lot of like support and 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 people love it. Like it was a very very immediate um, approval of the product, the the idea, and everything like that. Um, but sales were just not what it needed to be. And I, what I quickly realized is two things. One is you can't really build like mixer category is not the space to build like a very, you know, successful business because that is, if anyone goes to the grocery store, just think about how many times you wander down the mixer aisle. Like it is just not a place that people frequent unless they need something. So it's, it's a terrible place for discovery. Unless it's a holiday party. Unless it's a holiday party. And you usually are there just to like, okay, I need this thing. Let me go grab it. And then you're out. It is, you're very rarely like perusing the aisle and looking for a lot of different things. So there, the, the dynamics of that wasn't great. And I was mostly, I wasn't even selling in stores that much. I was like at farmer's markets. Um, and people would like come, you know, I'd say like every six to eight weeks and like re up on, on what they had. Um, and they would be like, yeah, we love it. Like, you know, I was like, okay, not to be rude. I appreciate everything you're doing, but like, why are you not buying more like or like what how are you drinking how frequently are you drinking it like oh well it's you know we just keep it on our bar cart and when we have friends over we'll like make drinks of it but you know like we, we don't we only drink a couple nights a week you know things like that and i'm like okay interesting you love the product but you best case scenario you use it like once a week yeah you'd have to sell so to so many people like just the the penetration and, and the ability to, to to do that there was was very narrow like i it was a um not yet yeah, not a great upside and, but there were some people that would come every week or every two weeks and they like, I could just tell something was different about them. And I was like, you know, kind of, you know, talking to them, asking them the same questions. And then finally one of them was like, Hey, I haven't really known how to tell you this, but I actually don't drink at all. Like I, I am sober and I have been for about like, you know, we'll call it five years and your drink is the first drink that I feel comfortable showing up to a party with. I'm like, what? That's interesting. He's like, yeah, well, I can go. I'll bring, I'll bring your drink. I'll make myself mocktails, but my friends there that do drink, I'll be like, Hey, here's this cool thing that you could try. Like mix it with your tequila. And I was like, interesting. And this is people, you know, I'd had that conversation with another person who was using it to mix with their lemon water. Um, and it was like, okay, so these people, one are, are having an experience that they've never had before with another product. Like they're able to go to a party and bring something and, and have that moment of like sharing with other people that since they stopped drinking, they haven't been able to do. And they're buying so much more than everyone else. It's like, you know, like alarms are going off, like, hey, bud, we need to pay attention to this. Um, as, you know, the theme has been, it took took another like 12 to 18 months before I actually like fully followed that. But um, I ended up being like, okay, you know, I personally am not drinking as much anymore. Maybe we need to focus on this non-alcoholic space and um, evolved the the mixer, which we were very like mixer, tequila mixer, heavy uh, packaging to more of like an elixir. Like this is kind of your multi-purpose. You can use it to make drinks with, but you can also use it as, you know, mixing with lemon water as like a electrolyte supplement after a workout, whatever you want to do. Um, but that again, similar kind of challenges came about where we, now we were selling a product that didn't have an aisle <laughs> in the entire store. Like we went from having a mixer that would go in the mixer aisle that granted it would not move off the shelves very quickly, but at least knew where it went. Now we had a product that was the same exact product that went in the mixer aisle, but now we're saying it's something different. And they're like, okay, is this a kombucha? No, there's like not carbon. So we, we had nowhere to kind of fit in the store. Um, and actually that decision to move to the elixir, like actually hit our sales even more. And I'm like, you know, kind of in a panic now. I'm like, okay, well, I can't, <laughs> can't just keep like making these evolutions. Um, but I wound up at a, it was April this year. I wound up at a um, networking event with a a group of people in, in Denver. One of which is a a friend and, and mentor of mine named Rob. And we're doing like a casual catch up about you know what's going on in business. And he's like, yeah, my mobile canning company just went out of business, so like I had to go buy my own canning line. I'm like, holy shit, that's like big investment, man. Like, are you like, I'm sorry to hear that. He's like, no, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like we already made all our money back on the investment and we have like all this extra line time. I'm actually thinking about getting into co-packing. Like, have you ever thought about canning your product? I'm like, 
yes, but like, I have no way of doing it. And he's like, I mean, he's like, if you can get me 15 gallons in, in two days, we could do a little test batch. And like, just like that, this like opportunity opened up to take this thing and, you know, solve for that biggest issue of like, where does it go in the store? So we go through a couple of different evolutions of, of testing and the dilution rate and everything, but we wind up with this canned product. Um, and it, it, this product that I have in front of me, you know, we're, we're calling it a smart seltzer. That's something I came up with two days ago on the way to the airport. Um, it's like, it's really geared towards people that are very health conscious, very much, you know, like very intentional about what they consume. A lot of those people tend to not drink or drink very minimally and give them something that is tastes great, is refreshing, is a, you know, like a social lubricant of sorts where you're holding something. It looks interesting. People are going to talk to you about it, but you're not consuming alcohol. Um, and that kind of product is, to your point, so different from this mixer for tequila that it started as, but it feels so authentic and true to who I am and who like the, the people are that we've, I've been connecting with the most and the brand has been connecting with the most. Um, so I know that was a, a few different evolutions of the product and everything, but it's, it was just, you know, a, the, the beauty of it is it shows your growth because you talked earlier about, and, and, and let me backtrack there. It shows your growth, but that's my addiction to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and my addiction to what this can do for anybody out there. So if you're listening, even if you've never thought about becoming an entrepreneur, I highly recommend just learning business and starting your own project because it forces you to grow because I'm going to highlight that right here and now where that first friend or mentor that you went to, you'd been pitching as soon as COVID come and it wanted to ruin your idea, I'm going to completely pivot and go into real estate. You have a friend, he kind of steps in, tells you X, Y, Z. But down the line, you start realizing shit like, okay, I'm in on this product, but it's not necessarily working. Mm -hmm. But instead of giving up and saying, I'm never going back to the farmer's market because my product is trash and not enough people are buying it, it's you start getting more curious. Okay, why? You learn that, oh, maybe my customer wants something different. What I think it is, isn't necessarily what they're using it for. And this happens so much, not just in business, but in real life. We have a conversation. We say something to somebody. They hear it in a different way than what we said it, right? It's the same thing in business. It's like, I give you this product. You might go use it for something completely different. But unless I ask you, I'm not going to know. So as soon as you figure that out, instead of giving up, you're like, all right, let's make this iteration. All right, iteration actually is doing worse than what we were doing first in the first place. But because you made that iteration and had the resilience to do it, you then set yourself up to go to this networking event where now you have the opportunity, but you could never see that opportunity when you were at the farmer's market. And that's what trips a lot of people up is mm -hmm. the time from the farmer's market to making the iteration where it feels like the world's about to crumble because you made a decision and you think it's a poor decision in the moment, but that decision that seemed poor, I mean, it's like the stock market. It goes down, buy at the down and then you go back up. So you basically bought at the down at that elixir, but that allowed you to then get to this point of like having this conversation with the co-packer. And now we're here. Mm -hmm. And most people that are, uh, the reason I describe that whole thing is because a lot of people um, that listen to this show might be in a, in a position where they've never been a full-time entrepreneur or, or produced a product. And your story is so similar to so many other stories that I've, I've either had on the show or in close conversations where you got to buy at the down is, is one of the, another thing that I say is like you, you were down and out, but you continue to go and be resilient. And that's where the light, as we're talking about light and darkness starts to show itself. Um, I will say, I actually mentioned this to my wife yesterday that, cause I was, I was trying to categorize her product. Like when we left that event, I was like, she, cause she liked it. That was an, that was another sign is like, she, she's, I'd say pick, pickier than me for a lot of different products. And when she was like, I like that, I started thinking like, well, what category is this in? And it kind of reminds me of luxury, luxury sparkling water where, I mean, like I gave you a Waterloo earlier to mix in with one of the other supplements I was having Sam try here, but I wouldn't drink like it, Waterloo is just like something that I would have just because, or like, but I wouldn't go to a bar and like, ask for a Waterloo. Yep. Right. Or go to a, a, a restaurant 
and ask for a Waterloo. And for you, the, sati- the, the it's much smoother and it's like a satiation of experience. Rather, the Waterloo is like something, it, it almost reminds me of like fast food. It's like, I'm just going to mix this with something else. And like, that's what it's kind of there for. Um, it's almost like this luxury market of drinkers that I haven't, I, I don't know enough about the space, but. I have conversations like this all the time. And one of the things in the CPG space that one of my buddies who I've invested in in the past and um, he told me because he was dealing with price points and where to place his product. And what he learned was like never be in the middle. Like either be the cheapest, which then you're going to have to raise a lot of money. You have to be a big player to be the cheapest or be a luxury where you can build great experience. I don't know if this is true for you, but that's kind of the experience that it gave for me is like, this is more of a luxury product that I would have a nice dinner with and, or a nice experience with. Um, but I, I just wanted to give you that feedback here live and I'd I love to hear it. now we're at like 55. So we're getting close to, to wrapping up. Where are you at today? Where are you trying to go? Because I'd love for somebody out there to hear your story and what you've been through. And maybe they either connect with you on something they're working on, or if they can hear your vision for the future. Um, you mentioned how you were bopping around different jobs. One thing I always like to try and do is like, if you're going to be growing and you have this vision, if someone hears it and is like, I want to jump on board, how do I connect with, with Sam? So tell us that vision. Where are you going? Where's the product going? How do people get involved? Yeah. Take it how, as you see it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, first of all, love the, really appreciate the feedback and it's very on um, in line with what I'm currently working through. I got, I have a meeting with natural grocers on Tuesday, mm. nice. um, a, you know, premium kind of grocery chain and very much we're, we're going for like a premium, you know, price point. And I'd say right now our best customer, um, is a music venue in Denver, um, they're selling our cans as like their premium non-alcoholic option. And, you know, we actually are like making these like kegged mocktails for them with our elixir base and building mocktails on top of it. And we're doing seasonal, seasonal flavors, but people, people are loving it. I think it's very much hitting the, the premium. It, it's interesting. I think both from a flavor, uh, flavor standpoint, as well as like, we're not an overly carbonated product, which I think is unique for carbonated, like canned carbonated beverages. Um, so very much expanding into more of the, the concert venue space, uh, you know, the, where we did the, event I think you yesterday. should market that more. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't, I, now that you mentioned that, because I think that's one of the reasons that my wife, Erin really enjoyed it is mm-hmm. like, and, and me too. Like, I don't really like that much carbonation. Um, I didn't even think about it though. Cause I just like the taste. So it was just like, yeah. now that I think about it, if you market it that more, I think that would also attract a certain Qu- customer. Quick aside for people too, is like the, um, Overly carbonated drinks typically have the most artificial products in it. Mm. And so like artificial sweeteners, uh, where it sits on your palate is like at the tip of your tongue. So if you were to just drink an artificially flavored drink that had no carbonation, it would it would be like a really like disgusting mouthfeel for you. So if you carbonate it, it pulls that to the more of like a full tongue experience. So the overly carbonated products typically have the worst like flavors, but it doesn't, you can't really tell because all you get is carbonation. It's just just like explosion in your mouth. Um, So we intentionally lightly carbonate because we use like all organic, you know, like dried mint leaves where we make this really beautiful herbal tea kind of like base and concentrate. Um, And the carbonation is really just for the sensation and kind of to amplify that, to to give it a little bit of a more interesting mouthfeel. but yeah, that's just a little a little education for the listeners there um, around the, uh, the the carbonation level. But yeah, I definitely like you know this product came out two months ago, and this l- label is like V one point two of of everything. So very much still in the stage of like being curious, get, trying to get feedback. What is resonating with people? Um, and it was actually at dinner last night with Eric and a lot of the you know a lot of our friends where people were talking about like how they just have not had anything that tastes like this before. And that makes it difficult for them to place, but because it's so interesting, they like are drawn to it and they want like, that's why you, you almost like they're, they're picking up a second and a third to try to identify what it tastes like. Like, wait, is that, is that spearmint? You know, that type of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about the, the path and the, the, you know, where we're, where we're headed with that. 
Um, but as far as the vision, I mean, you know, not to not to drop a bomb here too, but like I, one of the the brands that I admire most is Red Bull, and I think Red Bull did an incredible job of basically creating creating a career path for the action sports world. They just attached themselves to motocross, to dirt biking, you know, everything like uh, snowboarding, all of that. And I really think that uh, an underserved kind of community is the creative arts space. So what you're doing right now with podcasting, like I think that there's an opportunity to be what Red Bull is to action sports for creative arts. So artists, entrepreneurs, creatives of of any sort and kind of be their go-to drink while they're creating. Um, and that's why we put, yeah. So you have a drink for dreamers and doers and my, my feedback for, cause you mentioned like your labeling, you're, you're smart where you're investing in understanding the quality of the product internally before the external marketing. Yeah. A lot of people will just focus on the external marketing and basically marketing a shit product. So I love that you're focused on the internal first, but my feedback for, for, for this product in terms of the outside of it and what it looks like is if you were to show more of this in the front, you would sell me right away. Okay. The problem is when I'm looking at this in a store and I have three seconds, all I do is see this like thing that kind of looks like a sun. I don't know what that is. I also don't know how to say the name. Yep. So in two, in two instances, I'm like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it looks like and I don't know how to say it. So I'm not going to buy it. Yep. And I'm a different buyer than most people. But if you had somehow got, dreamers, doers, whatever to the front and you showcase that with some type of imagery, you have me in a heartbeat. And that's why like, like prime let's use, for example, like that energy drink, how yes, you have the Paul brothers who are huge and have a huge distribution to get any product to, but they wrote big, bold letters prime. If you walk through a store a lot of them, you can't even fucking tell what things are. And then you see Prime. Same thing with Red Bull. You walk through the store and you see Red Bull. So they did a very good job of like right from the start. Mm-hmm. You know what that is and who it's for. So for you, if you like preaching to the choir, like following your own advice, figure out how to bring that a drink for dreamers and doers. Ozo is created to nourish your mind, body, and soul, empowering you to reach your full potential. Take a sip, enjoy the journey, and inspire the world. You got to bring that to the front, bro. Yep. Like, because that'll sell me. And I know a lot of other people in a heartbeat. If I saw, if I'm walking through the lane and I see that versus anything else, because that's what I'm really buying into. I'm not, there's so many fucking products nowadays. It's like what I'm buying into is the feeling and what I believe it's going to do for me. Not to grow you here. On no, spot, I, 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 this, I, I love it. This is, I, I went into this weekend where it's like, this is going to be a, a big information <laughs> gathering because this is kind of the first you know, that a drink for dreamers and doers is it, like a month ago, we, we decided to put it on there. Cause that was the first time I was able to kind of distill down what I, who I'm trying to speak to, right. And like what, I, who I think our audience is. Um, but all of your feedback is so spot on and exactly, I, I appreciate you calling out those two things being what, what needs to be brought to the front. The other thing, you know, nobody pronounces the name right. And that's something that's been a constant challenge. Um, and like, why would Which you? Which is also a good thing. It's a good, so you might think it's, it's bad, but it's it gets people talking. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you say it? Yeah, right. Like, so it it's in the in the beginning, it might be a little sticking point, but over time, it's a good thing because then people are like, I mean, you came here in a Lyft or an Uber. Like, when Uber, like, how do you say it before yep. Uber? Like, people are like, what? Well, how do you say this thing? Uba, Uba. Mm-hmm. Like, what is this? So it's the same concept. I think the more so is how do you communicate who it's for. The, 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 that doer and like showcasing clearly on the front where I'm like, Oh, that's what I want. Yeah. Um, because, because of the, the name thing, like if you were a name like riot, like there's like riot energy, it's like, well, I can put two and two together. Like riot energy is probably their, their target market. I can probably guess. But when I read your name, it's like, Oh, I got to dig a little bit more. But if you had some type of imagery or some, something on there where I could deduce down to, Oh, this is for, creative types, the the doers out there, mm-hmm. like myself, um, this is the product that I want to buy. Yeah. 
don't know what it looks like, but this is why we record stuff like this. Cause maybe somebody that listened to it right now is like, fuck, I'm the person to create that for, mm-hmm. for my man, Sam here. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, and, and right now we're using like just uh, sticker labels yeah, and, yeah. and we're going to be evolving and we're coming out with two new flavors in the new year. And, and so there's an opportunity to really completely adjust and, and, and um, you know, tweak this I- visual identity of the can, the packaging. Um, and you know, to this point, I don't want to cut you off. No, please. But you mentioned The Rock and some other people. Is there any big name mocktail people out there? Kind of. There is a massive, like, I would say there's probably like 20 or so that would kind of consider themselves like mocktail influencers. Um, but as far as like real, like The Rock or, you know, any like A-list celebrity, there's not very many that are that are focused on that space. <sighs> that is something that to, to may potentially like mm-hmm. follow that thread through. Um, yeah. because I just thought about it. I was just like, I mean, I, I, one reason that I'm in the mocktail space, one, I'm two years, I haven't drank an alcohol, yeah. but like I'm big on passive income, like making money work for me. And one of the industries that I've been studying for such a long time, actually I've started studying it since ciders started coming out. I was really bullish on ciders. I was like, once people started s- drinking ciders, I'm like something weird is happening in the in the alcoholic space. Like people are branching out. And then hard kombucha came out. I was in San Diego. This is probably in 2019, 2018, right before COVID. And my wife and I were having hard kombucha. I was like, what the fuck is this? And I started doing more research on like where the alcoholic space is going. And now the data is showing like the generation below us is the lowest amount of drinkers like ever in history. And if you can, I just immediately think like, can we find a TikTok star out there that mm. is drinking your drink and like things like that? And as soon as you align with the dreamers and the doers, it's just like, man, the the, the space is growing. The opportunity is growing. Um, I'm excited for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, man, I, I'm so excited too. And, and I think I've been so ever since I decided to go into the beverage space and the kind of like alcohol, alcohol adjacent space, it's been, I've been confirmed uh, or just like so excited to keep getting deeper and deeper because it's ever changing. And to your point, like I, the the company that has created the space more or less, I'd say like athletic brewing really like did a, did a, an amazing job with that. Um, but all those companies are trying to sell to former beer drinkers and former, you know, people that drink alcohol and the younger generation is not that they are people that haven't drank at all. So they're just looking for something that tastes amazing, that is interesting and something they can, can connect with. And I think that's, that's the opportunity. That's where I'm trying to, to position ourselves. So when this new wave of, you know, 21 plus year olds that are maybe not drinking at all ever, We'll have something when they're, you know, out socializing with people. I love that. That's a smart way to think about it. But we're going to wrap up here. Last questions that I always ask everybody is if somebody loved this episode here today and they'd love to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. Well, you can find us on social media, um, Drink Oslo, and Oslo is spelled H-A-Z-L-O. Uh, this might be a, a part two, but Oslo means do it in Spanish. It's the command form of last year. That's why it's pronounced a little bit differently. But yeah, Drink Oslo, drinkoslo.com. Um, and my personal, um, my name's Sam Moore. You can find me on LinkedIn. And then um, my personal Instagram is Mr. Underscore Oslo. Awesome. I also want to ask you, because I, I don't do this, but since you are a, a founder, um, who do you want to connect with? So in, in tw- 20 seconds, like who out there are you looking to connect with right now? Yeah, I mean, to your earlier point, anyone in the creator space that is, you know, the spoke to and is interested in and, and, you know, I'm trying to find unique places to, quote unquote, sponsor and and have our presence there in the creative arts space. So would love that. Um, Would love anyone that is connected with any retail trains (laughs) or music venues or anything like that. Um, And yeah, just really, I guess anyone that this this episode resonated with, you know, I'd love expanding my network and just having conversations. So hell yeah, you heard it. Connect with Sam. Last question I always ask is if you were to define the word thriving, how would you define it? 
I think thriving happens when there's an alignment between what you're doing and what you believe in. And I think that's where I've constantly been striving to get to is um, having those two spaces of what's my, who am I at my core and what is it that I'm doing and bringing those two together. I think it's thriving. Wonderful response there. The end of every episode, I give my like biggest takeaway. And I think this one was easy today where you talked about what is pulling you, just like you're talking about here. You have to do things to understand what you don't like and what actually pulls you. It's so simple, but sometimes so hard. And I find myself in a time of life where I'm doing that, where this year was really dedicated towards my son and we're going to be putting him in daycare. So I'm going to free up a little bit of my time and I'm asking myself, like, where should that time go? And you spot on with the way that you responded to that and how I'm going to go about it. I'm just going to throw things on and then whatever pulls me, that's the thing I'm going to go all in on. So I appreciate you coming here today. It was an awesome conversation. Anybody out there that if you listen to this and you think that somebody can gain valuable insight from this and from Sam, please share that episode with them. That's the best way that we can grow the show and honestly connect Sam and you with other amazing people in this world. Um, give us that five-star rating review. Until next time, this is CJ Finley with the Thrive On Life podcast. Thrive on, y'all.